Okay, we're uh, starting up the session again. Our next speaker is Jessica Liu, who's an associate professor and chair of astronomy at UC Berkeley. Uh, she is PI of the Moving Universe Lab. That's her group. Uh, and she's gonna tell us about advances in AO next. Thank you. Can you hear me okay in the back? The microphone, excellent. Okay, so first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to come down and visit uh, Kaipak. Uh, you know, it doesn't seem like very far, but with traffic, you know how it goes. It's like flying across the country sometimes. Uh, so I'm here to talk about uh, advances in astronomical adaptive optics. And in the spirit of Kaipak, I'm gonna try and give equal balance to both the science that adaptive optics has yielded and the technology that's made it all possible. Okay, why do we need adaptive optics in the first place? So uh, you are familiar with these astronomical objects out there. We've heard lots about them, galaxies, planets, and everything in between. Uh, they're emitting radiation towards us. That radiation is pristine, beautiful, flat wavefronts, mostly, as it propagates through the IGM or the ISM, until it reaches our nice, comfy, cozy atmosphere we're all wrapped in, where it takes a very violent trip through that atmosphere. And the wavefronts that were once pristine are now highly perturbed and aberrated. Uh, yielding quite blurry and twinkly images that we see from the sky. So this uh, lovely picture of the homunculus nebula that you can see from just above the atmosphere with something like Hubble Space Telescope uh, becomes quite blurry and seeing limited uh, with our best ground-based telescopes uh, today, including things like Rubin. They'll only look as nice as that bottom picture. So what can we do? We can try to conceive of a way of correcting for all this turbulence, this aberration induced by the Earth's atmosphere, and that's where adaptive optics comes in. So this is what a real atmosphere does to a star's image. If it plays. Uh, there we go. Yeah, so this is a millisecond exposures series taken on a single bright star. It should be a perfect pinpoint of light, but it's not. It's quite aberrated and speckly, as you see. So the atmosphere is a dynamic uh, uh, effect. It's operating on millisecond time scales. If we want to correct it, we have to correspondingly run our AO systems uh, at those kinds of speeds. Here's schematically what an adaptive optic system is composed of. So starting from the top, you have the sunlight, the starlight coming through in a flat wave front, aberrated by the turbulent atmosphere, mostly at around 15, 10 kilometers above us is where the bulk of that aberration begins and then it just increases as it gets, as it gets down to the ground. Uh, when we hit our telescopes, we can build behind our primary and secondary, and instead of going straight to an instrument, we can instead send our light to an adaptive optic system that measures the aberration, applies a correction. So you have a measuring device, a wavefront sensor, and a corrector, which we often call a deformable mirror. Those two operate in conjunction in real time to then pass corrected light onto an instrument. So in addition to the wavefront sensor and the wavefront corrector, critically important to the advancement of adaptive optics is fast compute. If you're gonna run a millisecond timescales, you're gonna to need to have a very beefy real-time controller uh, computer that can run correspondingly at kilohertz or multiple kilohertz. So those are the basics of an AO system. Uh, and here's what it looks like in action. If you have some kind of incoming wavefront that's highly aberrated, you change the shape of your deformable mirror, your corrector in real time to respond to that. And hopefully your correction is fairly good. And you turn your images down here on the left-hand side from these blurry speckle things we saw before into those nice, sharp, now diffraction-limited images uh, that we can see on the, the far, so far right side. What does this do scientifically? Well, it's been a revolution, and that's not a joke. This is a picture of uh, weather on Uranus that was taken first above the atmosphere with Hubble in visible light. And then much more spectacularly on the right with Keck adaptive optics in the infrared. You can see the storms are much more clear. Uh, the ring is extremely well-defined. So Keck has a bigger aperture, it's 10 meters. Even though it's operating at two microns of light, it's got better spatial resolution or at least comparable spatial resolution to Hubble above the atmosphere. This is what the AO system has done for the study of um, uh, planets in our solar system. Also, it's on a very, uh, AO systems are on multiple telescopes now, and they're generally pretty accessible, less oversubscribed than Hubble often, which means we can study, uh, take images of these planets, not just once, but many times a year. In fact, uh, Keck has a lovely twilight program where they observe uh, the solar system planets basically almost every night or every few nights. And so they've been watching weather now for years on these systems and trying to understand uh, uh, how clouds form and evolve. So let's jump to the tech then. What's a key technology? These deformable mirrors are critical. 
And this is where, where it really gets interesting. There are a lot of different flavors of deformal mirrors out there. Uh, and, and Kaipak in particular, Bruce McIntosh has had a, a key role in these MEMS devices on the lower left. So let's talk about a few of these. These are really fun to think about. You're talking about a very thin face sheet, often millimeters in size, and you're pushing them with a thousand actuators on the backside. And you're doing that a thousand times a second or 2000 times a second. These are incredible machines, incredible, incredible engineering feats. And they come in flavors uh, where the actuators use piezo sort of solid state actuation. Uh, they're now these uh, very large mirrors. If you want to build a deformal mirror that looks like this size, you might use something like a voice coil magnetic levitation type actuator, or you can use a very low cost, very small compact MEMS device, uh, which uses the same kind of lithography techniques that you find on all kinds of devices, including CCDs. And all, that's composed of a thousand actuators. Each of them have their pros and cons, as you can see, I've highlighted there. And this is really where the action is on the technology development side. How do we build better deformal mirrors? What do these AO systems and improvements in these deformal mirrors do for us? Well, they can allow us to image exoplanets directly, as you saw in Rob's talk earlier. This is a spectacular image from Christian Mar. Uh, it's actually a movie now uh, from Christian Marwa and Jason Wang and and Bruce McIntosh, of course, showing four planets around a nearby star. These four planets, as you saw, they orbit. So we're taking, again, movies of the universe already uh, behind adaptive optics. And even better, these planets, we can now measure their orbits and we can tell how massive they are and how they relate to each other, whether this planetary system's dynamics are stable over long periods of time. There's just an enormous amount of science that comes from imaging this very first planetary system. So these extreme AO systems to image planets around other stars, they really are extreme. You need thousands of actuators on those deformal mirrors. You're trying to correct the turbulence as best as you can. Uh, and you have a really, really bright star that you can look at. You're only looking at a handful of bright stars nearby in the universe, not trying to get out past redshift 0.001. <laughs> That's all. So uh, for these kinds of systems, um, AO systems, the first generation of AO systems is relatively recent. That's only the eight to 10 meters today and maybe the four meters like Lick and the five meters like he uh, the Hale have had AO systems at all. So this is relatively new. And it was with the, uh, the build of Gemini Planet Imager, which uh, Bruce McIntosh has been deeply involved in, as you can see here, that's the big blue box mounted behind Gemini Telescope. Uh, but we built a dedicated machine just for looking for exoplanets around other stars. It's to whole, entirely tuned up to be able to find uh, those planets that I just showed you uh, and others like it. And here's a nice comparison image uh, from uh, GPI. This is actually a compilation of many different observatories all put together. And when the movie plays, you'll see we start with Hubble data and it looks kind of coarse. This is a planet, beta pick B, going around a star and then it's orbiting. And then suddenly we turn on GPI and you look at how much better it got uh, with this beautiful planet hunting machine now and tuned up with a, a very, very, very exquisite AO system. That's the power of what adaptive optics can do. But I, and I will point out that the spatial resolution on this image, if you were building a seeing limited telescope is maybe half the size of the image, right? So this is a discovery that just simply isn't possible without something like adaptive optics. GPI uh, the, is, was a first instrument of its kind being a dedicated uh, exoplanet imaging AO system and it's being upgraded right now. So I thought I'd show off a little bit of the KIPAC involvement uh, in upgrading it. Another key technology that, uh, that is very critical for adaptive optics, especially for exoplanet imaging is coronagraphs, which is now I see is misspelled up there. Uh, sorry about that. So these are some lovely new coronagraphic designs that are gonna go into GPI. And the most important thing is on the bottom here, you can see what you wanna do is you wanna block out and suppress the light from the star in the middle. You can barely see that it's there, that's great. And you wanna dig a nice dark hole around. And that's what this coronagraph is doing for you. You can see uh, on the far side is what uh, GPI today does, not much of a dark hole, but it's impressive what it's doing already. And then now the new system will have these lovely, lovely dark holes, which enable you to detect much lower mass, less luminous planets than has been previously detected. Uh, not only is it imaging that we're interested in for exoplanets, but also spectroscopy. And so this is an example spectrum that uh, GPI 2 the upgraded Gemini planet imager will give. Um, this is a, a really lovely measure of temperature 
uh, for these exoplanets. I mean, it's just amazing. We're able to go and find planets around other stars, and measure their temperatures and compositions now. Uh, this is not something we envisioned when we built Keck, for instance, or Gemini. This was not in their original science books, right? Okay, so that's a, all about how do we do adaptive optics on bright stars. But as I said, there's only a handful of those. What if we wanna look towards something like our own Milky Way galaxy deep into the center of the, that galaxy, for instance? We don't have a bright guide star. We don't have a bright star to reference and use as our measure of the aberrations, right? There's nothing we can look at in the optical at all. So what do we do? We invent a fake star uh, with lasers. So instead we use laser guide stars yeah, there we go. So this is a very uh, clever technology that's been developed. Uh, it was actually developed by the Department of Defense, um, but with significant developments by Department of Energy at Lawrence Livermore National Labs as well. Uh, in particular, these days, we mostly use sodium uh, laser beacons. And this is pretty neat. There's a sodium all through the Earth's atmosphere. It's deposited there by micrometeorites that rain down onto the Earth. These micrometeorites get destroyed and they float down through and settle down through the atmosphere. At about 90 kilometers, they're neutral. The sodium is mostly neutral. So if we illuminate that 90 kilometer layer, we can excite those sodium atoms and they, uh, they settle back down into, uh, given a, a transition at 589 nanometers, they can settle back down and glow as a fake star. So I think it's pretty cool that we make, we use meteors to <laughs> illuminate, make fake stars in our own atmosphere with a laser. I mean, come on, how cool can you get, right? That's a pretty cool technology. Okay, so these lasers, uh, they're at 90 kilometers. That's above all of the turbulence for the most part. Uh, so it's an excellent guide star. It's not perfect, but it's quite, quite good. So the one downside of the sodium lasers, which have been have had a huge contribution from Claire Max, who I showed over here on the right here, uh, who was at Lawrence Livermore National Labs and then later uh, had Bruce's job before Bruce's current job, which is the director of uh, University of California Observatories. Uh, those laser guide stars enable the same exact kind of AO system, except now you can look not just where bright stars are, but anywhere in the sky for the most part. You still have to have what we call a tip tilt star. There still has to be a brightish, less bright uh, star nearby, uh, but the laser mostly gets you to be able to look at your favorite galaxies, your favorite supernova, not just the bright um, planet hosting stars nearby. Uh, I just threw this in here really quick because this is a picture of Claire Max and Bruce McIntosh and Andrea Guez using, I'm pretty sure this is a laser guide star, one of the first laser guide star AO runs. Bruce, do you remember? That's even before there was that. Oh, uh, this is Speckle imaging days? Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is pre adaptive optics, but they were getting ramping up, showing what we could do with high resolution imaging a la experimental cameras slapped onto the backs of big telescopes. What can you do? So pretty impressive there. Uh, I believe this is actually at the summit of Keck, Teles Keck Observatory on Mauna Kea. Okay, why do we want laser guide star adaptive optic systems? Well, I told you we wanna look to places that don't have bright stars and the Galactic Center is a perfect example of that. And so one of the greatest discoveries that have come out of adaptive optic systems are a result of AO systems that take our images from this. This is a seeing limited image of the galactic center at infrared wavelengths and turn it into that. Okay, so yeah, everybody should ooh and ah. We all ooh and ah when we see it every night. <laughs> so yeah, it, this is not an experiment that's possible without adaptive optics. Uh, we, can, we can do it from space now with JWST. We could not do it with Hubble. Hubble was too blurry to do any of this experiment. So what's the experiment? We take pictures again and again and again, and we watch the stars move. And they move in spectacular ways. Let's get past this and show you how they move. So this is now a movie showing the measurements that we've made at the center of the galaxy, both with Keck and VLT adaptive optic systems over the course of the last 30 years now. <laughs> it's getting long. Uh, so you can see they move around some object that are orbiting something on fairly short periods, 15 year periods. Uh, and it's pretty easy to apply Kepler's laws. We often do this in our basic astronomy classes. The stars come within about 45 AU, that's a Sun-Pluto distance of something. When they do so, they're moving at about 12,000 kilometers per second. And that implies an enclosed volume, enclosed mass of about 4 million times the mass of the sun. And as much as people like to invent exotic things that could explain it, clusters of 
neutron stars, uh, quark stars, everything. The uncertainty has just gotten so small that the only plausible explanation is a supermassive black hole. So we now know where our closest supermassive black hole is, and it's obviously the most precisely measured black hole mass, uh, supermassive black hole mass that we have so far. Uh, that's It's not just the movies that we take over decades, I said 30 years, it's also the movies that we take within one night. This is now a very zoomed in adapt optics image of that supermassive black hole. And you could see when it was playing, there's a source that's very red that's flaring up and down. That's the accretion onto the supermassive black hole flaring up for a moment and then fading away. And it's always going off like popcorn. Uh, there's almost always activity every night we've ever looked at the black hole. It's doing something, gobbling little bits here and there. Uh, and that's something that was only enabled with Laser Guide Star AO. Uh, I remember Eric Becklin and Shelley Wright sitting, I was a young grad student, they were sitting in their offices and they got the first laser guide star AO images. And uh, they said, wait, what is that? Wait, that thing, that, that wasn't there before. And I could, I heard them and they were like jumping up and down. So here was this grad student and this old professor all jumping in their offices, so excited about this real time measurement of uh, the accretion onto the black hole. This is the kind of thing that I can imagine we will all be doing with Rubin images quite shortly. <laughs> they will look spectacular in real time with this video. Okay, so that laser is key. It's a key technology development for AO as well. Um, the major advance in the last decade for lasers, they haven't changed very much except to become just really turnkey. So you can just go and order a laser. It might take a year and a half to get, still costs a couple of million dollars, but it works and it works every night all the time. And that's critical because we want a lot more of these going forward. So the landscape for AO looks a little bit like this today. We try to maximize on all these different axes, but we can't. Uh, so we heard a lot about Etandu, but we're also concerned in AO about image quality. We just want the sharpest images we can possibly get. So that's one of our axes. And then for us, field of view is our biggest limitation in adaptive optics. All those images I showed were all tiny, 10 arc seconds on a side, not more. So that's been a huge limitation in the past. Uh, additionally, I mentioned that extreme AO was fantastic, really high image quality, but the sky coverage, you can't look at very many things. You can't do extreme AO on your favorite quasar at the moment. Okay, there are many next generation AO systems that are being developed to fill out this kind of space. You can make compromises, although you can build an AO system that has really wide fields of view, that's end of the board, or great sky coverage, but you're gonna sacrifice your image quality a little bit. And I'll show you a little bit more about that new flavor of AO. So these are new systems that are either not yet on sky, they're about to be on sky, or they're being proposed. Okay, so uh, again, no AO, classical AO corrects a field about the size of that yellow star, but these more advanced AO systems we can imagine correcting out to potentially even half a degree for that uh, very coarsest for form of AO, and that's what I'm gonna talk about next. So this ground layer adaptive optics, you're not correcting all the turbulence, you're only correcting the turbulence just above your telescope. That's generally about half the turbulence. The other half is much higher up. So if you can correct just that ground turbulence, you can correct over a large field. And so we're building now AO systems that require some new technologies, uh, some new large format adapt, uh, uh, adaptive secondary mirrors, like the one shown here, that you can replace your entire secondary mirror with your telescope now with an adaptive mirror. And once you do that, you can feed all of your existing high performance, high throughput, high sensitivity spectrographs with an AO system with just some small modifications. So now we're moving from those tiny little white boxes that were the previous AO fields of view to this big blue cyan box or more. We've built a demonstrator to show this technology exists and the kind of on-sky performance measurements we get at Mauna Kea take you from the blue, sort of 0.6 arc second seeing, to the red, sort of 0.3 or 0.4 arc second seeing. So you can think of this flavor of AO, which is still very new, as a seeing enhancement. This is a kind of technology you might consider for every telescope that you want to build in the future. This should not be restricted to just our largest. Every telescope could build such an AO system in a relatively cheap manner. And then what's lovely is it doesn't just work in the infrared, it works all across the optical spectrum. You see improvement in the seeing and the seeing gets more stable. You don't have those moments of bad seeing that you always get, and you're always so frustrated with at the telescope. So we're really looking forward to pushing this kind of ground layer technology, the seeing enhanced AO uh, to many more telescopes in the near future. 
There's also AO for small telescopes. To date, almost all AO systems exist on large telescopes, eight to 10 meters. Uh, but there is one exception, RoboAO here, which has been working on uh, two and three meter class telescopes, or in this case, it was the Palomar 1.5 meter. And what's amazing about these telescopes is they are survey machines. We heard about the vertical integration. Uh, this is a means of uh, contributing to that intermediate stack where you're vetting targets. You can look at hundreds of targets every night in ro purely robotic mode and get diffraction limited images. And don't forget, Hubble's a two meter, yeah. right? So fundamentally you can get an image that looks like Hubble over a little bit smaller field of view for thousands of targets. And then uh, lastly, there, as I said, we want many more lasers and we want to advance our AO corrections to something like what's on the top. So we're working on an AO system that would work optical through visible light all the way through, give you diffraction limited performance, but now over a bigger field of view, something like an arc minute maybe, right? So it's not huge, but it's comparable to the JWST or Hubble fields, uh, kind of a, along that same size. And it's very nice and uniform PSF over, the, over that field. There are two concepts in the works. This is the VLT Mavis instrument. You can see this is a beast of an AO system. It's quite large, but boy, look on uh, the angular resolution versus wavelength, uh, how spectacular it would be to have 10 milliarc second resolution images of the universe in the optical, and, uh, optical wavelengths. That would be incredible. It's uh, far superior to even JWST, uh, which is only diffraction limited to about two microns and would keep the eight to 10 meter class telescopes competitive in an ELT era. We would have matched resolutions between eight to 10 meters with AO in the optical and 30 meters in the infrared. And then lastly, we cannot uh, ignore just building bigger telescopes. You will always, as Rob said, do better and discover amazing new things that you can't predict if you build a bigger aperture. These days, that's only true if you also add an adaptive optic system to it. So this is a, a video of real data on the left and then simulations in the middle and the right. So on the left is current Keck AO today. The middle is even if we upgraded our current Keck AO system in the infrared and the right is what we would get with a 30 meter telescope. So now we're watching stars whiz around not in 15 years, but in five years. And we're seeing not three or four or five or 10 stars, but 30 or hundred stars that we can follow and monitor astrometrically and spectroscopically. Okay, so, and then last, my favorite science case that I'm working on these days is black holes. Uh, I'm very interested in finding free-floating black holes with adaptive optics and uh, Hubble, whatever we can use, high-resolution images using gravitational microlensing. That gives you a transient photometry signal, which we detect with Rubin, that's what we want. And then we start following it with astrometric measurements with Hubble or with Keck AO uh, to see and weigh that lens that's there, that invisible black hole. But AO applications run the entire gamut of all astronomy. We're talking about galactic centers. We're talking about strong gravitational lensing for cosmology. We're talking about galaxy evolution. Uh, we're talking about solar system science, stellar physics, and exoplanets. You name it, you name the field, and adaptive optics has made a contribution. And last, I just want to close with a fun little movie showing you adaptive optic systems live in action. Uh, this is a movie called Monica Summit, how pervasive it is. They are really in the other side. All right, that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Jessica, for that wonderful talk. We'll take some questions. Do we have one here? Jessica, that was fantastic. Do you foresee a time where instead of having to actually change the lenses, you can just do everything digitally? sort of deconvolve the noise in some way in real time? 
when we have truly zero read noise detectors, maybe, but you know, we're astronomers, we're always pushing the edge. So yeah, it, yeah. even if it's 0.01 electron read noise, I think we'll still want to be able to integrate mm -hmm. uh, and not just take real time fast exposures. Thank you. So anytime you do any processing to information, you lose something. What do you lose in this case? Yeah, so as I said, the field of view is where we are the most limited in adaptive optics. Uh, that and throughput. So all AO systems that have been built to date, uh, nearly all, I should say, um, you have the telescope, primary, secondary, and then you have another six or seven optics behind it for the AO system. And that's a very big throughput hit that you take. So we would love to build these large format mirrors where adaptive optics is baked into the telescope. And we're doing that for TMT and VLT and uh, ELT and GMT. Uh, then you can get rid of many of those downstream optics and maintain that beautiful throughput that we work so hard for, for our big spectrographs, for instance, but have them also be adaptive optics fed. So I'd say those are the two throughput, uh, which we can get to, but we haven't realized yet. And then the field of view, which is, that's an un insurmountable challenge. Uh, uh, we are still doing only intensity measurements. So we don't have, you know, normally you can, you can put a polarizing uh, imager behind it too, but we're still mostly doing intensity measurements these days. Well, thanks. Okay, Kevin. You sort of just answered my question, but yeah, I was going to ask about the throughput issue because in the Rubin era, we're going to have a bunch of 25th mag targets. And for the first time, the sky background in the optical will actually be bright enough that it's a big limiting factor. Mm -hmm. And so the PSF is a big deal. And so, yeah, I wanted to ask about the system where you just have the adaptive secondary correcting for the ground layer. Is that basically like no extra reflections compared to a normal Cassegrain system? That's right. So in fact, for say Kex, uh, we're planning a ground layer AO system where we just swap out the secondary and we feed all the existing instruments. You have to insert wavefront sensors, but they are outside your path, your beam path, your science path. So they're out around the edges of the field of view. You shoot lasers up and sense those down. And then the regular old light goes straight through to MOSFIRE or uh, LRIS or whatever your favorite instrument is. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you. Okay, Roger, you have one? There's, there's a couple questions there. Can, can we take one over there and then come back to Roger? Okay. There we go. Um, yeah, so I, I work on Ruben's active optic system, and we uh, it, it's not trivial to get our algorithms to run in the time constraint we have, and we're going way slower than you are. So I I don't even know what question to ask, but can can you say anything about how you have to design these algorithms to get them to to run, you know, a thousand times a second? Like, are are they simpler than you'd want them to be? Like, is there a lot of work that has to go in to make these things like super efficient? Yeah. So there's an expert sitting right behind you, on <laughs> Bruce, the other way. <laughs> he can tell you all about it. Uh, but I'll just say uh, for adaptive optics, it's just a really big sparse matrix inversion. Uh, so there's lots of really good techniques for doing that very quickly. Um, but it still demands, not always, but the, the fastest and uh, highest performing uh, machines are pretty much always running on GPUs. Uh, you can do it with CPUs too. Um, it just depends on how many of those actuators and wavefront sensor sub apertures you have. Um, so yeah, it's, pretty, it's a pretty beefy and dedicated and very specialized type of computing. And we're not even close to doing what we could do with it. So right now we do those wavefront sensor measurements and we uh, find the correction and then we throw that information away. Uh, there is so much information there. We have our AO telemetry streams are at least a terabyte a night and we have done nothing with any of that data. There's so much that we could do to predict forward in time. Uh, this predictive control that Bruce has worked on with others. Um, that we could look at how it um, fits into the, say, the rest of the telescope, say Keck primary mirror segment phasing or temperatures or anything like that. So there's a lot of information that we haven't really tapped into because it's just data overload for us, which I'm sure is the true for Ruben as well. So you made a good case that ground layer AO systems, if they can be cheap enough, can really help revolutionize things. I would agree, especially if you can push it to the blue. Yeah. Uh, you've been describing sodium beacons here. The one I'm most familiar with is SOAR, where we have a Rayleigh beam, and um, and there we can't do we can't do U. It's even hard doing G at times. 
What, what will it take to do G or U? So uh, the AO system that I showed you, we were already at B band mm. on Mauna Kea, not at the source site. Uh, that was natural guide stereo, but actually natural guide stereo for ground layer is worse. You want to use these Rayleigh beacons, which they make a fake star, not at 90 kilometers, but maybe 10 or 15 kilometers, because then they only sense mostly the ground. They don't sense the high stuff. Uh, so those lasers are cheaper. So they're only a few, uh, like 100K each. Uh, and the wavefront sensors are easier to make. Um, and then uh, all you can put all of that together and you can run all the way up into U-band. You're not going to get fraction limited images, but we see seeing improvements all the way to B-band, which is the bluest we've tested. We could swap, swap a U-band. That's, that's why it's hard to do G-U. Um, so how, how can you do with those? What do you mean almost all the light is it? Oh, uh, right. So you want to put your laser. So the problem with the source system is it's a relatively small field of view. Uh, it's like four arc minutes. You want to go out, you want to put your lasers way out, like 30 arc minutes, 20 arc minutes uh, diameter. Get them out of the way, side launch them. So when you have a bigger telescope, that's a little easier. And then there's not much backscatter. Yeah. We could also use UV lasers too, if you wanted, which are, are cheap. Uh, thinking about the challenges you were talking about with wide field adaptive optics, but, but also that old picture of Bruce uh, sitting in, in Keck trying to do speckle imaging. I'm wondering, do, do you think there is a role for speckle imaging or lucky imaging alongside AO to give us the, the kind of resolution across wide fields we would ideally want? In principle, yes, you can already do that today. Fast read speckle is hard on wide format cameras, right? So I think to be able to read at a millisecond a large format detector will be challenging for the foreseeable future. So I don't know if it has a role other than sort of experimental verification on a handful of things. Uh, but for real science, I think it would still be pretty challenging. But if we could give you the fast readout cameras, then Maybe. you'd think again. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd be interested. Just, so I'm thinking, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I had that same coffee conversation. Is if we can get to a, a large format fast detector, it's definitely worth trying. Okay, let's thank Jessica again.